long I wondered could this thing last but the age of miracles hadn't passed or suddenly There is a certain romantic element to it. Um, walking down to the embankment uh, from St. Bartholomew's, for instance, with gas lamps and, uh, and a swirl of fog, listen to Vaughan Williams' London Symphony. The slow movement captures it completely. We grew up with fogs. We used to go down to Portobello Road and nick the fruit and, and nick anything that we could get hold of, but nobody would chase us because of the fog. They wouldn't run after us. I can remember fogs being every winter, but they don't—they they don't sort of actually strike a note with me. But because my dad died that weekend, I can remember the weekend very clearly. Any fog would cause an increase in deaths, but this was sudden. You see, in most cases, those people would have been taken into hospital but this came like a killer in the night, literally. In December 1952, the world's romance with London's fog ended in a disaster, the true extent of which has never been acknowledged. Now, hidden documents reveal how one of the world's worst peacetime catastrophes claimed as many as 12,000 lives in the centre of London. The Christmas shopping season had just begun when the fog descended on the city. I don't think the bleating devil himself could have driven it away. It was that thick. On that night, it was vicious. It was a warm fog. It was wrapped around you. It was, it was all-possessing. It was smelly, it was dirty, it was black. It had an acrid, acid feel about it. It seeped into the houses, and indoors, everywhere was covered with a sort of grey film. It's quite uncanny. Around about three o'clock, it started getting more dense. And towards the four o'clock period, our crane driver said that he couldn't see. His visibility was down to nil. And we couldn't see him, but he said he could see the clouds. He could see above him, but he couldn't see through. So there was a mantle of thick fog between the ground and he was somewhat 50 foot above us. And in consequence, we stopped work. The Great Fog not only did its best to keep shipping tied up, it made things very unpleasant for everybody. At Sadler's Wells, a performance of La Traviata was stopped when the audience could no longer see the stage. The fog had came down while we were in the cinema, and you couldn't see the screen. You, the, it, it was, I mean, you could see that it was light, but you couldn't make out the details on the screen, so you simply went home. And you're talking about here an enclosed building, but that's what it would do. It would come into, in, in, God only knows how it did, but it did, it came in. At the Smithfield Livestock Show, Stockman tried using whiskey-soaked hessian masks to protect the cattle from the fog. Well, it was a green colour, and it hung around in these caves down below. It never got clear. There was no way it could get clear. Every beast has to lie down just as you and I do, and they just never got up. 
traffic in London was completely at a standstill on many occasions. In fact, the fog was the worst on record for many a year. The street lights you couldn't see. And it was really blacker than any blackout we had during the war. Because it was bugger all you could see. It was one of the first times, I think, when I realised that although I was partially sighted, my other senses were far more acute than anybody else's. My mother always came to meet me from school. She was talking to me, trying to make it seem as natural as possible so that I wouldn't get worried and afraid. And I suddenly told her to stop. And if I hadn't done, she'd have hit her nose on the wall because she just hadn't realised the wall was so close. She was inches from it. But I'd heard her voice change with the sound echoing back from the wall, which was obviously even thicker than the, the smog. My younger brother was on a funeral which started out at West Hendon, and by coincidence there was another funeral in the same road that same afternoon, and in the smog the two funerals got completely mixed up, and there was just a, a convoy of two lots of funeral vehicles, a milk float, a dust cart, and that wasn't very popular. Fog, the longest and thickest on record, brings Britain its darkest days since the blackout. It gives transport services an even bigger headache than bank holiday. I was walking in front of a vehicle going into East Ham Memorial Hospital. and got, got in there, pulled round to the casualty and walked around the back of the ambulance and behind me was a, a baker's van. And he put his head out the window and said, well, where are we, mate? You know, I said, we're at East Ham Memorial. He said, oh, I thought you knew where you was going. So I said, well, I do, but you're the one that's lost. Once here, the fog comes to stay. Slowing down traffic of all kinds, cutting down visibility to a dangerous degree, putting a premium on how to get to work, and more important still, some may think on how to get home. Showing in many folks, but that one was outstanding in uh, uh, 1952, because uh, fog and, and smut just used to stick to the window. It was, it was like sticking there, like paint. You just couldn't see through it. So you had to, if you was going to try and make a, a journey, you had to either li lean out through the side window on your left, if you could get out that way, or l look out through the door on this side. When the buses came to Stanford Hill, they all stopped and they didn't move any further because of the fog. My father was stuck there. My young brother went down to look for him, walked down to the hill, we lived about uh, another bus stop up the road here, in Elmer's Park. And uh, he uh, found my father on the bus and half carried him home. My father was actually at work at Camberwell and he walked home um, that, that night. So, and it was the following morning that he was really, he couldn't breathe. In Britain, weather always makes news. If it isn't a blizzard, it's fog. Perhaps it means a good summer to follow, perhaps. Meanwhile, the beastly stuff gets right into you. <coughs> oh, can't see. <coughs> can't breathe. <laughs> oh, people were going sick all over the place. They were just falling down and just couldn't, they just couldn't breathe. And you could see my father was very ill. My brother was cradling him in his arms, you know, he couldn't get his breath. You could see it was really bad. The doctor said it when he came in the next day. He's weakening, his heart is weakening. Of course, by then, the fog was really, really thick, and it was coming in all through the windows. This was a problem, and into the room. A movie-turned cameraman drove through fog-shrouded London to report on the traffic chaos. The great smog invasion has caused a major dislocation of rail services. It's a menace, this choking, eye-watering smog. During the night, I heard Mum banging on next door's wall and screaming out. And there was no ambulances, so you couldn't get ambulances out. The only way that, that they could get ambulances was if somebody walked in front of them with a flare. One ambulance making its way across the city was carrying a young army doctor and his patient, a 21-year-old sailor who had collapsed in the fog. I've never seen anything like it in a person of that age, a, a young man on active service in a state of complete collapse with uh, breathing difficulties and obviously with uh, 
a, a desperately failing heart. I tried the, the two local hospitals, but unfortunately they were overwhelmed with civilian cases, uh, chest problems which had flared up because of fog and, and they could hardly cope. Uh, so it had to be mailed back. And when we got there with a great sense of elation, we, we'd made it against all the odds. And I rushed out to the back to find that um, he had just died as we arrived. Just, just at that moment, breathe his last. I tried to resuscitate him, but uh, that, that was pointless. And uh, the drivers were in tears. And I personally felt a great sense of defeat. He died on a Tuesday evening, it was buried Wednesday morning. We were very, very upset with uh, when he died, naturally. He was such a lovely man, you know. Tolerant, understanding. He's just a lovely person. He was. My dad was 42 when he died. I can remember him quite well, really well, um, in fact. Um, he had a very distinctive knock at the door. Um, and I can remember that very well. And for a long time afterwards, I used to listen for the knock at the door. He was a lovely man, actually. Really lovely man. In the aftermath, questions began to be asked. Why had this particular fog taken so many lives? Why had London been so unprepared? The minister in charge of the government's response was Harold Macmillan. Macmillan was very offhand in the Commons. If you read his replies, well, yeah, members can't blame my colleague for the weather, and th this kind of remark. And th th there was no acceptance that, that uh, uh, this was a man-made disaster which uh, needed remedial action. I, I, am, I, I am not satisfied that further general legislation is necessary at present. We do what we can. But the honourable gentleman must realise the enormous numbers of broad economic considerations that have to be taken into account. As he joined his family for Christmas in 1952, Harold Macmillan was still blaming the weather. The culprit is the November sun. Having already shed its summer load, it fails to provide sufficient heat to dispel warm currents of air arriving from the Gulf Stream. Britain was back in the dark ages. It was in the Dark Ages that London's air first began to turn bad. <laughs> 